Hi everybody. Welcome to Anatomy with Dr. Rabbitheart. I'm Teresa Patitucci, a medical educator and anatomist at the Medical College of Wisconsin. In this video, we will discuss the gross anatomy of the arm. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe the bony and muscular components of the arm, including their innervation and blood supply. Here is an outline of the topics we will discuss in this video, which correspond to the Roman numerals in the upper left-hand corner of each slide. The upper limb can be considered in several sections, the shoulder, arm, forearm, and hand. The elbow also allows for movement between the arm and forearm, while the shoulder allows for movement between the thorax and upper limb. The focus of this video is on the arm. Note that the word root brachii refers to the humerus and is often included in terms associated with the humerus bone and thus structures in the region of the arm. Let's begin by discussing bony landmarks that provide attachment sites for muscles in the arm. These include components of the scapula, humerus, radius, and ulna. Around the shoulder, we can observe several bony features relevant to other structures in the arm. On the scapula, I want to point out the glenoid fossa, which articulates with the humerus, and the coracoid process, which is the site of attachment for several muscles. On the humerus, we can see the head of the humerus, which articulates with the glenoid fossa of the scapula. We can also see the greater and lesser tubercles, which are bumps on the proximal lateral humerus. Between the hum tubercles is the intertubercular sulcus. Along the shaft of the humerus is a bump called the deltoid tuberosity. And as you may have guessed, this is a site of attachment for the deltoid muscle. We can also see a groove spiraling inferiorly along the shaft, which is called the radial groove and is a channel in the bone where the radial nerve runs. Now we'll look at features near the elbow. On the distal humerus, we can see the capitulum and the trochlea, where the capitulum is associated with the head of the radius and the trochlea articulates with the ulna. Posteriorly, we can see the olecranon fossa. On the sides of the distal humerus are the medial epicondyle, which is a site of attachment for the flexors and pronators of the forearm, and the lateral epicondyle, which is a site of attachment for the extensors. On the ulna, we can see the coronoid process anteriorly and the olecranon posteriorly. Finally, on the radius, we can see the head of the radius and also the radial tuberosity, which is a site of attachment for the biceps brachii muscle. In the limbs, muscles are separated into compartments by sheets of connective tissue. The arm contains two muscle compartments, the anterior and posterior compartments. Muscles in the anterior compartment work together to flex the forearm at the elbow, while those in the posterior compartment extend the forearm at the elbow. A large neurovascular bundle containing the brachial artery and branches of the brachial plexus runs in the groove between the compartments on the medial portion of the arm. Now let's talk about each muscle of the arm individually. The anterior compartment of the arm has three muscles. The coracobrachialis muscle attaches to the coracoid process of the scapula and shaft of the humerus. When it contracts, it flexes and adducts the arm at the shoulder. Brachialis attaches to the shaft of the humerus and the coronoid process of the ulna. Contraction leads to flexion at the elbow. Finally, is the biceps brachii muscle, which has two heads. The long head, which has an attachment to a bump just superior to the glenoid fossa, and the short head, which attaches to the coracoid process of the scapula near the coracobrachialis. Note that long versus short heads of a muscle refer to the length of the tendon and not the muscle belly. Both heads of the biceps insert on the radial tuberosity. Additionally, an aponeurosis, which is a broad, flat tendon, reaches medially superficial to some of the forearm flexors. The biceps function to flex and supinate the forearm. So try this on yourself. 
Flex your forearm like you're showing off your muscles, showing off your biceps, with your fist pointing towards your head. Place the hand of your opposite limb on your flexed biceps. Now pronate the hand, which in this position means turning your fist to face laterally. What did you feel happen to the biceps? Did you feel them relax? They should have. Note that all three muscles listed on this slide are innervated by a single nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve. The only muscle in the posterior compartment of the arm is the triceps brachii muscle, which has three heads, long, lateral, and medial. The long head attaches just inferior to the glenoid fossa, while the lateral head originates along the posterior shaft of the humerus. If we reflect the lateral head, we can see the medial head laying right along the bone. All three heads insert via a common tendon onto the olecranon of the ulna. The triceps function together to extend the forearm at the elbow and are all innervated by the radial nerve. Innervation from nerves and blood from nearby arteries allows these muscles to function. The musculocutaneous nerve innervates all three muscles in the anterior compartment of the arm. It branches off the lateral cord of the brachial plexus and immediately pierces the coracobrachialis muscle before going on to innervate the other two muscles, brachialis and biceps brachii. The brachial artery supplies blood to the anterior compartment of the arm and runs with the median and ulnar nerves in the bicipital groove, which is the indentation on the medial arm between the anterior and posterior compartments. Note that a pulse from the brachial artery can be found in this groove. Try to find it on yourself. The radial nerve runs along the radial groove of the humerus and innervates the triceps muscle, which is the only muscle in the posterior compartment of the arm. The radial nerve runs between the lateral and medial heads of the triceps, along with the profunda brachii artery, which is a branch of the brachial artery that supplies blood to the posterior compartment. Note that the long head of the triceps slips between the teres major and minor muscles to create the quadrangular space which serves as a passageway for the axillary nerve and posterior circumflex humeral artery, supplying the deltoid muscle. Sensation from the skin of the arm is transmitted by several nerves. Sensation from the lateral forearm comes from the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which is a continuation of musculocutaneous. The intercostal brachial nerve is a branch of the second intercostal nerve and innervates a small patch of skin on the superior medial arm. Sensation from the inferior medial arm comes through the medial brachial cutaneous nerve, while sensation from the medial forearm is from the medial antebrachial cutaneous nerve. Finally, sensation from the posterior upper limb comes through the radial nerve. Before we wrap up, let's pause to check your understanding. A mover tries to lift a box of medical textbooks that was too heavy and felt a sharp pain in his shoulder. He has some weakness flexing at the elbow, and when he does, you see the anterior arm form a Popeye sign, as in the image below. X-rays do not show any fractures, but MRI reveals a ruptured or torn tendon. The tendon of which muscle is likely torn in this patient? Feel free to pause the video to think. The correct answer is A, biceps brachii long head, which has a long tendon that passes superior to the shoulder joint to the supraglenoid tubercle, a bump superior to the glenoid fossa. Due to its long course, this tendon is prone to injury. Luckily, action of the short head of the biceps can often compensate for this injury to allow flexion at the elbow. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you like my artwork, subscribe to my channel or follow me on Twitter or Instagram at, at DrRabbitHeart.